Okay, so thank you, Guya, for the very kind introduction. And thank you for having us today uh, here at the seminar. Uh, it's, it's, first of all, it's really uh, a pleasure to have Pete around because we were just discussing that yesterday when, you know, we've been working together on this project for a while now. You know, it's been something that has occupied a bit of our time, but like, in our, as I say, it's our hobby. Uh, but in many ways, I don't, we don't quite remember the last time we saw each other, um, you know, face to face. So it was good to bring Pete to Lisbon and to show him around as well. And um, so the work we're going to present here today is um, entitled Spreading Rebellion, an analysis of XR um, transnational diffusion. And, and as we'll see, it's a, a work in which we try, and we basically built a data set to uh, do a quantitative analysis of XR expansion since 2008 uh, around the world. And our argument, and these chapters, uh, these, as we'll see, we'll use the chapters as a proxy to that diffusion over time. Um, because it allows us to see not only the rhythm and the time, the timing of the spread, but also the geographical location through which XR um, expanded and diffused. Um, this is um, our argument is basically that the big jumps in XR um, diffusion have to do with their own action in terms of eventful protests right at the beginning of their creation, so to say, in 2018, 2019. And this is a work, uh, this is a paper that has been submitted to the Journal of Sociology. Uh, we added a few more things because meanwhile, we collected a bit more data uh, um, that we'll kind of try to bring on to our, to our, um, to our presentation as well. And uh, and now we're still in the review and we're waiting for the answer, but also the feedback of the public. And thank you for being here interested in our work. Um, and we'll see, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about as well where we kind of see our this research going. So in terms of our outline for today, we'll start with a brief introduction to um, this work and where it comes from. Then we'll contextualize ex uh, Extinction Rebellion do a literature review that uh, we use for this particular piece of work, then talk about what we understand as chapters, um, talk about the methods and the data sets that we created for this work, the findings and then conclusions of future work. So I think, you know, um, I think it's, it's always interesting to start with the more personal story about how uh, this work uh, how scientific work can start. And basically, Pete and I, we were in the same PhD cohort in Cambridge in 2013. So we did our PhDs together. We had the same supervisor. And we we're doing completely different topics. But throughout the PhD, we obviously we talked a lot and we met in uh, the coffee and, 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 and various pubs around Cambridge. But also, um, at some point, Pete invited me me and Ben Abrams, I don't know if he's around, but in the, in the audience, but he invited, a, invited the two of us to write a paper on the uses of flags in protest. The three of us wrote that paper that was never got published, in fact. We tried a few, a few journals, but, um, but actually that created the space for the book that Pete is editing and is coming out next year on symbolic objects with Ben but also created the space for later on, uh, Pete inviting me to write a book chapter with him, which you can see here, uh, which is uh, the intersection of the planes of crisis for uh, a book that is coming out to Amsterdam University Press next year. Um, and which we, we started by wanting to analyze objects in various movements, but then we narrowed it down to, um, to Extinction Rebellion, and then how we kind of started to like be interested in Extinction Rebellion and focusing more and trying to understand what Extinction Rebellion was and where that would take us. Uh, and throughout almost um, 
you know, looking at the data and the, the resources around, we kind of understood, well, what would be really interesting to do would be to study the patterns of internationalization and transnational diffusion of Extinction Rebellion. Um, and that led us to this, um, the second, what we're presenting here today, which is um, a, 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 an article that we had the collaboration also of Maria Wallenstein, uh, who was uh, working with us over the summer um, to collect this data. And we still expecting the, the, the response from um, the, the, the journals, but uh, we look forward for your feedback as well. So Extinction Rebellion emerged, emerged in 2008 in the United Kingdom, um, as many of you might know. Um, and it spread uh, all over the world in a way. A lot of the countries adopted uh, the name or the brand almost, as we say, of Extinction Rebellion. And in many ways, in a lot of the analysis that we've done, and in the, actually the, the, the first chapter that we wrote, we could see that a lot of the repertoires that Extinction Rebellion used have some kind of connection with previous repertoires of civil disobedience and the environmental movement in the UK, although we don't make that you know, a big claim on that. Um, I think the turning point for a lot of these movements, not only Extinction Rebellion, but also Fridays for Future and the school strikes uh, that happened over uh, with Greta Thunberg and so on, um, was the IPCC report by uh, the United Nations um, scientific panel that published uh, in 2018 a report saying that we had 12 years to change the, um, the, the, um, the path in terms of carbon emission that we were taking. And Extinction Rebellion, um, who um, has a lot of scientists in, 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 in these ranks, in their ranks, took this uh, to do, to build their frame and discourse around also a discourse of crisis and catastrophe, as we argue in the previous uh, chapter that we wrote. Um, and so David Bailey also wrote, so it, it doesn't only, Extinction Rebellion doesn't only appear in the context of the IPCC report. Actually, uh, David Bailey analyzed uh, protest event analysis of the last 40 years in the UK. And he actually showed that the last 10 years have, have been of increasing contention. And also that um, since 2017, 18, there was an increase in the number of environmental protests. So uh, this is just to contextualize Extinction Rebellion and the work that we're doing. Um, there's, as uh, a lot of the movements that emerged recently, there's sparse but expanding work on it. We have that we've cited here in the PowerPoint. Uh, you have repertoires of action and organization by Bergwin and Schmidt, social composition and attitudes by Saunders, Doherty and Haynes. Um, but also you have some work on internationalization, the topic that we're taking uh, forward, but mainly case studies of New Zealand and Canada. Um, so going to the literature in review, you know, um, that we've done to frame this, this work, um, we set it up two topics, environmental movements and transnational diffusion and eventual protests in the next slide. What we know in terms of transnationalization from the work of Jackie Smith, it's that since the 1970s, there's been an increasing transnationalization of social movements. She and her colleagues have built a data set of organizational um, of organizations that work transnationally. And she actually shows that from the, the 1970s and, until, the, until the last decade, the environmental social movements increased from 10%. Uh, the environmental social movements, 10% uh, of the transnational social movements to 27.1, which makes it the second uh, highest hiring, hiring rank cause after human rights. There's a lot of work as well on new environmentalism by a lot of in, a lot of British authors, in fact, like Dorothy and Doyle and Christian Roots, um, that, sh that tells us as well that um, environmentalism since the 70s 
um, as we have here, shows uh, very little evidence of global environmental protest action or groups working effectively across borders. And in many ways, organizations remain highly centralized, institutionalized, and based in the global north. And a very interesting uh, article uh, by Chris Christopher Roots um, that tells that in the UK, environmental social movements have a limited transnationalization, even though they try to get abroad and work across borders. Uh, in many ways, they're still very much um, concerned with the massive issue. And so we kind of ask if 2018 constitutes a new landscape for environmental movements, is a turning point in terms of these patterns found in previous research. And so in our own work, um, given what I already said about uh, the work that David Baylor developed, um, we claim in a way, and our argument is that the spread of XR outside uh, the United Kingdom, it's not related only with these political opportunity structures where um, you, know, you have uh, scientists coming out and saying, well, we need to uh, start solving this issue. It all, XR also made, if you want, their own um, opportunity structures uh, and through this idea of eventful protests uh, that Donatella Della Porta has, um, and normally I think of, uh, like to explain this in the following way, normally we tend to see protest events as dependent variables, the consequence of a particular context or environment, but we can turn this on its head and say, well, actually, event, protest, if protest events can have an impact in context and change and create new dynamics of protest um, around the world. Uh, or around a particular cycle of protest. And this is the argument that we'll explore further in the data that we collected. So, um, let's find my way in here. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to um, take us from here to uh, look at the um, methodology that we, we decided upon um, and uh, to go through some of the core um, areas of findings that we that we came across um, through through the research. Um, in terms of methods, one of the things we decided to do, one of the um, decisions we made was to focus on the chapter. Um, XR is um, ha follows this this organizational structure of the chapter, um, which is meant to be a very localized. Um, Group, small group of individuals um, in a particular area who meet regularly to, um, to organize uh, actions in order to be locally relevant um, and, uh, and then to come together as multiple different chapters in order to take a larger action um, collectively. Um, and so we decided to really focus on this. This is something which is very concrete and we could, um, we could see a way to to get quite effective data on the rise and spread of, of, of chapters. Um, but we also felt that we can't just assume that just because a chapter is meant to be something like this, some kind of small scale local group who meet, who meet regularly that we, that we just assume that um, that is exactly what it is. Um, so we decided to um, try to theorize it a little bit further and to explain a little bit further. Actually, we think that the chapter has um, at least three um, uh, features or, or things that we should um, consider when we're looking at the chapter. Um, we should think about it as an organizational strategy. So it's not necessarily um, the spread of XR as much as, um, to be clear, the spread of an organizational strategy wherein individuals claim to be part of XR. Um, so it's more of the, the spread of a form of organization um, that includes certain similar features, such as um, similar cultures um, and, um, and other, other similarities, but, but primarily um, in terms of name identifying um, as Extinction Rebellion. Um, secondly, we think that there is an aspect of kind of an imagined community. Uh, 
basically XR doesn't have official membership. You're not a member of XR. Um, and so being part of a chapter basically allows for the building of a sense of community and a sense of identity amongst activists um, who may well, in, in Benedict Anderson's terms, um, uh, never meet each other, um, may never be in contact with each other, um, and yet they imagine themselves to be part of this kind of exile community around the world. Um, and a third aspect that we thought was kind of important here about the XR chapter is, um, is the fact that it, it, it functions a little bit like a brand um, in that there are commonalities of culture, of practices, of performances often, um, but also importantly of aesthetics. Um, the specific branding of XR gets kind of um, used and reused by different chapters around the world and, and through this kind of aesthetic, you, you see that um, Again, that kind of feeds into imagined, imagined community. And we think it's kind of important to note that it's not just allegory that XR functions as a brand in this way, but also um, it, it's, quite, it's quite direct. If you go on XR's website, you can download stencils. So there's kind of a homogenous um, aesthetic of XR, um, which you think we think is kind of interesting. So what we decided to do methodologically then to, to study the chapter was first of all to create the XR data, um, XR chapters data set. Um, and uh, we used web scraping um, with Python um, in order to uh, basically scrape data um, via the, the website um, of all of the chapters registered with XR. Um, and that gave us access to quite a range of really important data, including uh, the name of the chapter, the location, um, in the world, it's contact details, um, uh, well, certain contact details are publicly available. Um, links to social media pages, if they have them, most of them have at least one form of, so of social media, um, but um, more than that, um, kind of a little moment. Uh, we decided to use the Facebook creation date as the best proxy that we could find for the creation date of the chapter. Um, and we think it's a reasonable proxy to use um, for, for that uh, because social media is basically something that um, every movement is going to need to have in the 21st century in order to um, function effectively as a, as a social movement. We also find that uh, only 174 out of the 1,265 chapters didn't have a Facebook group. Um, so it is, um, it's, it's a, our best, our best guess without, um, basically doing, um, uh, well, we, we talk quite a lot actually about, about what would, what would, be, what would be better. And even if we had like qualitative details from all of these 1,000, um, 2,265 chapters, um, relying on people's memories for the point of creation, I think we've been doing interviews and people can't really remember very effectively exactly the date um, or the month that it was started. So um, that information may not even be um, uh, achievable to, um, to, to gain. Um, uh, but of course, we'll, we'll be certainly welcome any other um, points or thoughts on, on that. Um, we think it's a, it's a decent proxy. The second data set that we created um, was in order to try to analyze um, uh, eventful uh, kind of theory of um, eventful protest in regards to uh, chapter creation in XR. Um, and so with, with the help of uh, Maria, um, who was uh, working with us as a, as a research um, assistant, um, uh, we created this data set, which was basically a systematic inventory of all major protest events associated with XR around the world. Um, this was uh, no small feat. <laughs> Um, and um, we're certainly very thankful to Maria for, for a yeah. lot of effort on that. Um, and uh, this then needed to be, uh, we needed to kind of work with that data and try, try to see what patterns we could see um, within that, try to make sense of, of a large number of, um, a very large number of relatively small protest actions um, and then some, some larger ones. Um, we then analyzed the timings of these in conjunction with the temporal data that we could get from the XR chapters. Um, so in terms of findings, there are three areas that we are 
um, we were kind of particularly interested in looking at, and that's the geographical dynamics, the temporal dynamics, and uh, then looking at the, the protest event data in relation to the geographical and temporal spread um, of XR. Um, but it's probably, it's probably worth mentioning as well that um, re really our, our core aim um, in doing this at this point was just to be able to accurately describe what happened. How did um, this particular form of association with XR, a particular form of, of organization spread um, throughout the world? How, how did that occur? So, in terms of geographical data, um, or ge geographical dynamics, um, as you zoom out on the XR's own, X on XR's own website, uh, it bunches uh, the uh, chapters into numbers. So um, that's why you're seeing some, some bunches. And you can see some very large bunches, um, North America, um, Europe, um, in Oceania. Um, we'll go look at that in a little bit, a little bit more detail. Um, so this is kind of more of a, a, a fun representation, um, basically of this of like um, of where these chapters are based. Because um, um, there obviously some some problems with, but it does tell us something. We analyze distance from distance from London as a way of kind of seeing how where, where the kind of distribution um, is. We see forty one percent within five hundred kilometers of of London. Um, another seventeen percent in the next part over. And we, as we get out into kind of um, southern and eastern Europe, it becomes less, um, and then beyond that, uh, very small indeed. Although we were laughing about this um, this out, this outer rim um, with only 0.2 percent, but like that's that, that is a lot of that is in Sahara and um, in Siberia, so not a lot of people live there, which may also in Greenland. Um, yes, yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> um, so uh, it's more of kind of a, a bit of a visual representation of the point rather than. Um, anything kind of particularly more than that. Um, but we see that also represented in the data here. So in terms of the number of XR chapters per continent, we see around 70% in Europe, and we see about 30% elsewhere. Um, and we see larger numbers in North America and in Oceania. By country, uh, we see um, by far the largest number being in the UK. Um, beyond that, we then see um, a real uh, uh, prominence of, uh, of Europe, of Western Europe, um, and of uh, the Anglosphere, um, UK, Australia, Canada, um, United States, New Zealand, um, uh, Ireland. Uh, probably notable here in the kind of um, higher uh, numbers uh, is India, uh, 20. Um, obviously, India is a massive population, but, um, but another country with with a relatively large number of um, number of uh, of chapters. Um, and so, yeah, we, we we see from this basically uh, the idea that the XR chapter, in terms of high density, is particularly Anglo um, Anglophone and particularly European. Uh, well, then we're able to transfer this onto this is kind of a map of the world according to according to XR, um, and we see some clusters around the world. We see kind of an Oceania cluster. We see a North American cluster. Um, we see the European cluster, um, particularly high density um, as you get closer to London. Um, we also see these other clusters: an Indian cluster, a South African cluster, um, a cluster around Lake Victoria, and a cluster in, in, in West Africa. Um, and we also see a cluster basically around the band you know, of South America between Montevideo and um, Santiago um, in Chile. Um, so we see, the, we see these clusters, um, but, but there's also an important point here about, about density. This isn't just a story of, um, of uh, where people live in the world, um, it's not just about human, human population density. Um, in certain scenarios, say in, in India, uh, uh, it's very often in kind of larger urban centers that we need one, uh, one chapter. In some countries, there is only one um, per country. So uh, you can see in the West African cluster, um, there's uh, Senegal, there's um, Sierra Leone, uh, Gambia, Ghana, uh, Burkina Faso, um, all having kind of one national chapter. 
Um, uh, Nigeria has, has a few more, but again, kind of usually kind of one per city um, uh, and only a relatively small number overall. Um, so there is, there is kind of a, a, a difference in, in how dense, how like um, uh, localized these are. Um, say if we take, uh, 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 you know, Australia, for example, um, you look into one of the cities, one of the kind of major cities, um, and they might have maybe seven or eight chapters um, localized even by like area of the city. Um, so much greater density, much kind of, um, uh, much more localized uh, structure and form, form of the chapter. Um, and so this, this is a question for us really, you know, why, why is this the case? Uh, why in some place is it, is there an incredibly high density and, and, and why in other places they're like, did this not catch on? Is this a decision? Is it a change in tactics? Um, what is, or are there other causes? Like what's, what's actually causing this? Um, and this is this is really a case for uh, some. This is something that we're going to continue to look into. Something we're inter interested in um, continuing with as we're as we're um, undertaking um, interview research in in a lot of uh, a lot of these countries. Um, and we want to try to find that answer, but it's not something we can really find from the data that we have, um, the, the quantity of data we have at the minute. But we wanted to give you a little bit of an insight at this point into what we. Um, what we find from that qualitative interview research. So here is a couple of um, a couple of insights: one from New Zealand and one from the Gambia. So in New Zealand, one of our interviewees said uh, um, what they did was an organizational nightmare. They were advised to create their own group, but they were not just adequate, but they were not adequately linked to the national group. So, for example, probably each of those, what set what thirty seven, has their own Facebook page. I don't know of thirty seven. I know of um, Wangari, which is asleep, but we've got two people who, are, who keep connecting. Oakland Tam Tamaki Maka, Maka Rao, I'm sorry, my pronunciation of um, uh, New Zealand names is, is terrible. Um, apologies, Tom, on the phone. Um, <laughs> um, Hamilton is asleep, uh, Taranga is asleep, Taranaki is asleep. Um, a, a name that we couldn't actually get from the transcription group is asleep. Um, <laughs> we tried hard. <laughs> Um, Thomas and North is asleep, or they have a little group that um, starts things periodically. And so let's go over to the east. Um, Hawks Bay is asleep, down through Wairapa. Um, they wake up whenever Wellington is doing something. Wellington is weak, but they're building a must say. Down in the South Island, I don't know how, how many we've got now. Um, Wairapa, Nelson is weak. Um, they're there, but weak. Um, Christchurch is strong. Uh, Dunedin is strong. Invercargill is actually for the size of the city quite strong and Queenstown is a presence, that's it. Um, and so, uh, so we can see actually where there was this really intense um, density of chapters in New Zealand that didn't last and actually caused quite a lot of problems um, and tons of these chapters just um, started to fail over time. Um, but there was we also COVID meanwhile, right? So, that's, that's true, yeah. Um, which, <laughs> Caused a lot of uh, troubles in terms of organizations. Uh, yeah, sorry. That's, that's definitely true. Yeah, no, no, that's that's for sure the case. Um, so it, here, here's a little insight from from the Gambia that we've had so far, um, which is kind of the reverse case. Um, uh, but some interesting aspects here. Um, so our interviewee said uh, it depends on people um, on people that want to set up XR chapters in the communities in their region. Um, we are always telling people if you want to start a new chapter, you can. Tell Extinction Rebellion um, through their website, um, and we've seen seen people that are concerned by the crisis coming up, starting new chapters. I would say probably in Australia or other Western countries, they are more aware of Extinction Rebellion because of their media, plus access to internet and digital devices. You should be able to know how many of us are struggling with such in Africa. So yeah, this is also something that is part of the reason why people are not aware of XR in this region. And, it also, and also it depends on people that think the movement can become, adopt, become an adopted movement in their own culture. We've seen people saying XR is a truly white movement because of their tactics in the global north. So I guess that's also a, feel, a fear that people are having, like people of, culture, of color, that the fear that they're having which is holding them back. So I want basically in Africa, what we're trying to, we're trying to say is that we need to adopt XR or adapt XR to our own culture. Um, 
So here we see various reasons why uh, we didn't see the same density of chapter creation in West Africa, um, in the Gambia. Um, uh, another really interesting point that, that was raised by this interview was the, um, the issue that they came across in the African context of, of, call, of people trying to, of people calling themselves rebels. Because referring to yourself as a rebel in many contexts um, in Africa has, has very negative connotations of being part of um, very dangerous groups. Um, and so uh, deciding, to, <laughs> deciding to call yourself um, a rebel, that's again maybe um, something that we can see as like um, part of kind of European um, white culture is meaning one thing but in another context means something really quite different and was that has been a kind of stumbling block of a problem for the for the movement in Gambia. Um, but we thought that would be interesting just to give a bit of insight kind of qualitative insight to what we're finding so far. So on to temporal dynamics and this is a graph of um, XR chapter creation over time within the UK only. Um, so in February uh, 2017, we see the, the creation of Rising Up in Bristol, which was the movement that then went on to become XR. So um, for, the, for, for the first uh, year um, and a half, um, that's, uh, there was kind of one, one chapter. Um, Rising Up then spread to one other place in the UK before both of them changed to XR and, uh, and the movement became XR when it, when it, when it began. Temporally, we can see um, the declaration of rebellion um, in, uh, in 2018 um, as a kind of key moment there um, after which um, this incredibly fast expansion. Um, we thought it was interesting as well to add in uh, here, uh, this is the point when COVID-19 lockdown begins in the UK. Um, and although the movement was reducing, the, the number of chapters was um, increasing at a decreasing rate, um, we really see a flatline um, there uh, from, um, from spring 2020 um, onwards and haven't really recovered. Um, although there was a question for us about whether uh, kind of a certain threshold, a certain capacity was being reached in the UK anyway by that, by that point. Looking at the data temporally, ignoring everything else but just the black line for now, um, this is all chapters around the world over time. Um, and this is just the sheer number that, are, that it has been created each individual month. Um, so we can see certain spikes. We see, we see a spike in kind of um, uh, in uh, uh, winter uh, 2018. We see another in kind of um, late spring, early summer in 20, 2018. Um, and we can, you can see the other um, peaks as we go along. And we saw from that, um, we started to see the kind of a, a pattern in the temporal data um, where there are basically these, these particular phases um, in the creation of, of chapters. And we organized it basically around, around those peaks. That's, that's um, where we went with analyzing the data. So you can see these five phases, um, these five phases here um, on the graph. Um, and so, if we look at that, um, the, the temporal data across the world uh, geographically, um, we, see, we see this. So in the first phase, actually, a very large number of new chapters were created. Um, in the second phase, um, quite a number more. Um, and uh, we can see that continuing on up to um, the most recent, uh, recent creations of, of chapters in Nepal and in Thailand, um, kind of quite, quite, quite recently, actually, they both came um, after since we since we um, initially did this um, did the data analysis, we added that in um, subsequently. It was in the kind of late summer um, and into autumn uh, 2021. Um, so there are still new create new chapters being created um, within different um, different states. But what's interesting we think here is is it isn't the case that that XR's chapters spread. Um, to the UK or within the UK initially, and then subsequent, subsequently spread to other places in the world. But actually, it's in phase one, um, we actually see um, dramatic increases in the number of chapters around the world. Um, it spread to a, a large number of chapters already at that point. Um, so uh, this, this uh, um, graph tells us a little bit more about uh, new chapters being um, Created initially, we've got on the, the kind of green bars is uh, new chapters per phase. That's the number of new chapters per phase. 
Um, and then we also have a cumulative um, figure. Um, we can see uh, in um, the, 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 the length of time for each phase is not the same. Um, so for example, phase four is actually a bit longer than phase um, three. So even though it's roughly, it's not that far off, it actually is a longer time period. And the final phase, phase five is a, is a very long um, period of time. Um, and so we see a relative, a very, very kind of small number of new, um, new chapters being created over that phase. Um, and so, um, um, this uh, this graph basically it, it tells us about uh, the percentage of chapters being created in different parts of the world um, per phase. Um, so in the first phase, we see the UK as being the place where most chapters are being created. But at the same time, we see um, we see many being created in the rest of Europe. Um, we see uh, North America and Oceania as, as having a large number as well, um, and, and also in other places um, around the world outside of those. Um, and gradually over time, the percentage of new chapters being created per phase um, kind of starts to expand a bit out. Um, we see uh, by summer, the summer 2019 phase, phase three, um, uh, Europe actually overtakes the UK in terms of the, the, the numbers, the percentage of chapters created. Um, uh, and then by the end, um, by, through the, over the pandemic, actually the number of um, uh, European chapters being created is kind of by far the largest percentage, although there is a, a relatively small number um, uh, in, that, in that period. Um, we then have, uh, because this is kind of, it's potentially a little bit confusing because it's the percentage of chapters per phase, um, we thought it would be useful to, to basically explain the, um, the new chapters by re region and phase um, cumulatively. Um, so you can see this over time. And again, what we're seeing fairly clearly is um, over time, the creation of a, of a, of a fairly clearly Anglo, uh, Anglophone um, and European dominated um, sphere um, uh, with, uh, with XR chapters as being highly uh, localized activist centers in, in these spaces um, and more uh, in terms of kind of single national. Um, so we see the popping up of new, um, new nations around the world, uh, new national chapters around the world, um, but, uh, but not um, expanding beyond that, um, as we can see over time as well. So finally, to, to go on to protest events um, and the spread of XR and the kind of relationship between, between those, um, essentially we, we can see in the data two key protest events which had the greatest effect over time on the creation of chapters. And those two events are the declaration of, protest, uh, de declaration of rebellion in um, October 2018 and the spring 2019 international rebellion. And after these two events, um, we saw uh, like uh, basically massive increases in the number of chapters being created. Um, and also um, uh, with the international rebellion, also the, the, um, the inter internationalization, the further internationalization of the movement to a considerable degree. Um, and actually, this was something we we felt we saw in the data, um, so we, we felt we could interpret from the data, um, but actually through our interviews, we're, we're seeing that kind of playing out as well um, to a considerable extent. Um, so just to give you a few, a few quotes from our, um, from our interviews um, on, this, on this point. So one, um, one interview said, um, I heard about Extinction Rebellion, um, I guess it would have been about three years ago. Um, it was before it got started in New Zealand and it's just a new thing in the UK. A friend of mine was talking about it with some enthusiasm and some deep sense of purpose. And I was curious, you know, anything that was calling uh, was called by this was going to make me curious. And I watched to see when activities would um, begin in New Zealand. Um, another uh, interviewee said, when London was shut down, shut down by XR, I thought, wow, that's interesting. Wow, I wish that was happening here. And then I saw in the local paper yet another public meeting, everything you need to know about the climate crisis. And I thought, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and then uh, there was a subtitle, and what to do about it. So I thought, yeah, OK, I'll check them out. And it was a very cynical, oh, I can't imagine they're, um, they're onto it at all. Well, it was XR doing the talk. And this is the point when this person got 
um, really involved in, in XR in um, Aotearoa and New Zealand. And so here is another quote from, um, this is from the Gambia. When we saw the protests in 2019, where XR blocked London Bridge, and they were able to force the government, I would say, to declare a climate and ecological uh, emergency. When we saw such a movement that is able to tell the government that this is what you need to do, and then they succeeded in telling the government to declare a climate and ecological emergency, we were inspired. And that's how we got in touch with the international team. And that's uh, how we got, um, oh, and established XR in Gambia with their guidance. Um, so it, we're kind of, um, I guess we're, we're, we're more confident that this mm. is correct, um, that our analysis is correct from, um, from this, um, um, this additional data. Yeah, just to add, I remember yeah. doing the interviews and, and commenting to each other afterwards. Well, actually that kind of confirms what the intuition with that we had from the data. So uh, we can add that to the presentation. In fact, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, and just one final kind of um, uh, point on this, which is the counter example. Um, so we thought uh, the bushfire rebellion in January 2020, really major event, it was widely reported, and it was really international in character. So it took place in 27 countries around the world, six African states, four in Asia, three in South America. Um, so obviously, a, obviously, an impactful um, protest or a, a protest that had um, uh, had uh, considerable um, uh, a considerable range, um, but it failed to see uh, or to the fruits of which were not. Uh, this increased rate of chapter production that happened um, prior, in prior um, uh, after prior events. Um, so we see this as, a, as an interesting kind of example. It's not to say that, therefore, it wasn't uh, uh, impactful or eventful in, in, in other ways that it, it, it may have been, but in terms of the creation of new chapters and the spread of chapters around the world, um, um, uh, we, we don't see that, um, that happening after this. So I'll take yeah. a bit. Well, as we um, were able to see with this data that we've collected, uh, it still seems that XR is still very much a Western dominant, dominated movement, that you have 70 to 90% of their chapters in Europe, North America, and Oceania, right? But that doesn't mean that there are not important pockets of clusters in the global south, such as the one that we um, say from Montevideo to Santiago and Western South Africa around particular regions, which we're actually looking at the data of then population density and actually are one of the most densely populated regions in Africa, um, like Victoria and India. Um, and what we can see in terms of temporal dynamics is that um, eventful protests actually had an impact in create, creating a, a buzz, if you want, and disseminating the ideas behind XR and creating a, a curiosity. And that's very clear from, you know, not the many, uh, the very few interviews that we've done so far. And we hope that the next interview somehow can uh, confirm our, uh, our hypothesis here and the idea that we have behind this, this, this article. But that, you know, between the, the late eight, nine, um, 2018 and spring 2019, there's a creation of chapters and a transnational spread. And it's really interesting to, if you think of that map where we have the colors, that the first phases seem to be dominant in terms of Europe, North America, UK. Um, but actually in later phases, uh, Asia and Africa, even, um, even if uh, only one or two chapters, they start appearing also in those countries. And one of the things that we were discussing this morning as we were like finishing to prepare this, this discussion, we said maybe we should go back to the data because it seems that in the global south, we have much more national and regional um, uh, chapters uh, rather than as in the Western world where we have very local chapters instead of regional ones. So that, that could be uh, at the next stage of work because there was an idea that came up 
as we were uh, finishing uh, the preparation of these presentations in this morning. Um, and um, uh, I think this data, and we think that this data is uh, the quantitative data gives a, a good idea. It doesn't tell, the, it doesn't give a good idea of the rhythm and the ge geographical diffusion of the movement. Still, um, we try to identify the mechanism or the process behind it, even if I think we think that the interviews are going to give us much more detail about how the spread occurs and what are the reasons behind it. Um, and there's also like other interesting points that we found and we've been finding in the data that we've collected because a lot of the groups that were already in some parts of the world that were already environmental groups that then uh, change their name somehow or join XR uh, to be part of a more global movement. And I, I just wanted to uh, point out that actually it's the, the impact of, and the outcomes of this movement, even if they're sometimes hardly tangible, I think we wouldn't be discussing the way we're discussing um, the environmental um, questions that we have today if it, were, if it was just for scientists. I think movements have had a great uh, importance in, in not, not only XR, but also Fridays for Future and the school strikes have had a great um, impact in creating awareness. Um, so in terms of future work, and actually we'd like your input on this as well. Um, we, as um, uh, the Talking Hats song say, we've been making this as we go along. Um, and actually, you know, as we find new data and we, we try to get new ideas, uh, and as we say, we do this as almost a hobby that we do in our free time, this project. But um, but we, and after finishing this paper, we start thinking, well, where, where else can we go? Where, how can we collect more data and where should we go? And we thought, well, let's try to do national surveys and actually send a web survey to, um, to XR in various countries and see how it goes. But with the rate of response was so um, diminished that we thought, okay, we probably need to switch strategy and focus on interviews. And I think that has been a much more effective strategy, so to say. So I think the next step are actually to continue doing these interviews and do case studies of countries, but also of clusters of thinking, what are the connections between, for instance, Australia and New Zealand? Are there any similarities between these two countries or Canada and the US, the US? So, but also to try to think of the North-South dynamics between these groups. We'll keep doing, uh, we have a few more ideas about also doing some sort of online ethnography where we visit the, the social media pages and try to understand a bit more the actions of chapters around the world. But also we found that they have newsletter and documents that we can consult and check what they've been doing. And in February, we're going to do an event with a lot of uh, people from XR. We hope we still have to think about what this event is going to be but to try to meet with uh, activists in the international community and to see what they would tell us about this, their strategies. And that's it, and thank you for being present, <laughs> being here, thank you. Okay, I can. Um, okay. Um, you are now the chair. I'm now the chair. <laughs> uh, I have we have questions here already written, but uh, we maybe we can um, also uh, collect more a few more questions as we. No, 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 no. It's uh, oh well. We have a lot of actually have a lot of a lot of questions from, from here. Uh, um, just to answer Miriam, yes, the, the recording will be available afterwards. Uh, well, to be had to leave. Um, so maybe we can start answering some of these questions yeah, here sure. in the chat. Um, well, Jill asks, do you find patterns of low creation of chapters associated with the increase of protest events has stagnation of chapter creation can have different interpretations. Would be also nice to have a focus 
on subnational diffusion, at least in the UK. Yeah, that's uh, interesting. Maybe Jill can also come up. Uh, I don't know if she's still around. I don't know if Jill you want to come up and talk to us as well. <laughs> Maybe not. Oh, oh yes, I can. Oh, hi. <laughs> um so yeah thank you for your presentation um it was very uh, nice to see uh, uh all the work that you already done uh, i was wondering uh maybe i missed this part because of the connection i'm in brazil so the connection is not always good um um i think you you set up two uh, different data sets one with uh, chapters and the other one uh, based on events if i'm not mistaken Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so uh, I did not understand why uh, you don't present much data, well, much uh, results on the on the events. Maybe I miss, I miss this part because of a, a sound break. Uh, I don't know. So uh, my fear is that your uh, interpretation interpretation of what you present on um, uh, chapters creation could also be explained by the fact that they are very busy organizing events. And um, in order to organize successful events, it's better to have less uh, chapters. Um, but that's only a simple hypothesis. Uh, well, I, I suppose so one, one, uh, one issue with that interpretation would be that um, uh, the creation of chapters is usually um this is this is kind of for it seems for better or for worse within xr there seems to be uh, multiple um, views on on this but um the creation of those chapters is um by anyone who is kind of seemingly willing to basically sign up to a, a very small range of key principles um and from from then on it's it's autonomous um, so in New Zealand, it seemed like uh, there was an issue with that, um, in that some of these chapters were created by people who were not experienced in organizing or being part of social movements, but were kind of new um, to social movements. Um, and so they created it, but there was no kind of organ organizational strategy beyond that. Um, so actually, the, the, it's, not, it's not the case that um, that anyone at the kind of national or international level, level appears to be particularly like setting these things up as much as people kind of come forward and, and, and suggest that they should be um, a, a, a chapter. And so, and so the, the, the two things are quite, they run quite separately, quite, quite differently and different sets of people who are kind of setting up chapters um, and others who are kind of busy organizing events. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, so um, for a bit of clarity, this, there, this, um, this is the reason why we didn't share this data. Basically, um, uh, I'll show you the uh, um, where it goes. It kind of runs from there to uh, yeah. the whole second and uh, third page. Um, so we, we couldn't find a, a good way to basically present that um, effectively. And, and, and the PowerPoint. We, we, you're right, we, we, we should. We need to try and work on how we can how we can present that in a way which is um, which is more straightforward. Um, but basically, what it, what it boiled down to was like um, uh, uh, seeing where these um, these various events fell um, and looking at kind of uh, rates of uh, both temp temporally and geog geographically what kind of effect was going on. Um, and we just we weren't able to see. Um, it's quite that that data, as you can imagine, there's quite a lot of uh, there's quite a lot going on there. But what we were able to see clearly was um, these two um, specific protest events as having having very clear effects in terms of um, uh, create the creation of chapters. Um, but we weren't able to see um, anything beyond that. It becomes very difficult to make um, definitive um, uh, claims about that. I mean, it may be the case actually that like. Um, especially when we get more qualitative data, we might be able to find something on that, like uh, like a particular protest um, is kind of referenced by a lot of different people. That's like actually it was, it was this. It took us a little bit of time to get organized, but actually it was this particular protest. And we're we're definitely open to 
to that occurring. And this, this is what we can see anyway from that. Um, I hope that, that, that answers your question um, sufficiently. Um, it, as, as insufficient as it might be. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, now we thank you, Joel. Uh, Miriam, very insightful. Uh, do you want to join us, Miriam? Still there? Hi, uh, I'm not sure if you can hear me. Yeah, yeah, we can. Excellent. Hi, uh, very nice to meet you. I'm going to show my face if you can see it. It doesn't matter. Uh, hi, I am um, very thankful for your study of the XR movement. Uh, and I was considering, I, I had questions about the ethical considerations around such a study. I saw that you focused more on quantitative analysis. Uh, which withdraws some of those uh, concerns. And I think in the end that you were open to more ethnographic work, uh, which makes complete sense. Uh, I guess this is a, a, a you're in for the long haul. Uh, but I mean, in my work with other movements uh, about the transnationalization of um, social justice quests, uh, I was uh, wondering about the data that was. Uh, that could be collected. I noticed that Facebook prevents uh, web, scrap, web scraping. So I'm curious to know how you went around um, this or what you took into consideration when collecting the data. Uh, you quickly went through it, but I was wondering if you could uh, go into a detail about that. And second, if there were any specifics related to the, to the XR movement, since I know that this is quite uh, I mean, all the activists I've met from XR are quite um, cautious about the, the, the trail of information they leave online, on Facebook, um, and so on, compared to other uh, similar movements, uh, even transnational movements, not just uh, subnational and local movements. So that's it. Uh, thank you very much. Um. Uh, I can go yeah. for the first one, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, we, um, yeah, that's true. I mean, Facebook, I mean, it's, you, you have, to, I mean, I don't know if I can, uh, well, Facebook, you can scrape the data, but you have to use some tricks, basically. <laughs> uh, and since it's not for commercial use, we were, um, um we were careful to um check that and i discussed that i don't know if joel will help us to write and to collect the data around but um we checked that and since it's not for commercial use we could do it actually it's no different from doing it by hand right so yeah um there were they were blocking the um the uh, ip is that how you call it uh, a few times and we had to go over that but since like as i said since it's not for commercial uses i don't think we'll have any troubles on that uh okay uh uh do you face um yeah on ethical uh, ethical issues yeah and, um this is this is something that actually we um we took a very long time over um uh uh in terms of in terms of interviews and data collection, um, like the quality of data collection, um, we're kind of very we're very aware of that, and so uh, we have a, a variety of things in place, um, kind of usual um, requirements in terms of consent, um, in terms of like being clear about the information how it's going to be used, um, anonymity, all of those kinds of things. Um, obviously, that's incredibly important. Um, we've also thought quite quite a lot about about our case studies. Yeah, obviously, obviously, mm. in some parts of the world, it is more dangerous to be part of such a movement. We actually initially said that we would do data collection in one particular state, which um, which we'll, I won't name, um, but uh, decided against it. Even though we actually we did it so carefully that we got we got ethical approval to collect data there, we decided subsequently against doing doing that um, for for that reason. Um, so we are being very, very careful with that, um, with all of the things and making sure that things are very um, effectively in, in place um, and, and discussing those issues with, yeah. with everyone that we speak to before we, before we go on. Um, yeah. uh, so that, and, and that will be something we're, we're very kind of, uh, very keen on being careful with going, going forward. Um, uh, on the web, web scripting issue, I think, I think you've covered that. Yeah. Essentially, um, from Facebook, the only information we, we we took was the creation date, and that's something which is um, is 
uh, freely available. Um, mm. Yeah, we could even do it manually if we wanted to. It would just take a lot of time. <laughs> we, we need other research assistants. Yeah. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, we have now we have Matthew. Huh? Uh, okay. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. Um, well, yeah, other, yeah. other, yeah, I was looking, at, I mean, I can answer um, to this. Um, maybe we should take the question, actually. Um, so have you, have you considered comparing geographical distribution of XR with other social movements, especially climate movements, thinking of climate camps and Occupy as two direct precursors to XR, in tactics and discourses, um, and also social networks? Um, well, yeah, uh, we do yeah. think when we were tracing back at the beginning in the first summer that we were working on this, and probably we were in lockdown, that's why we were more than doing this. Um, and we actually traced, tried to trace back a lot of the origins of, in terms of green parties, in terms of environmental movements in the UK as well. And one of the arguments that we kind of make, it's a lot of their, repertoires and tactics, you know, actually come from Occupy type of movements, you know, occupation of the streets, the horizontality is present well, it was present as well in the global justice movements, but we do think we, we haven't exactly compared the, um, these maps to see if there is any um, overlap between the presence of chapters and the climate camps in Occupy with XR. I did notice, I just yesterday I was looking to a map of Occupy and there were some differences um, where XR was, I think it was a bit more spread than Occupy and Occupy was a bit more, even more Western than, than, um, than, um, than, uh, than, uh, than XR, sorry. Um, but yeah, that's certainly something that we should do uh, in the future, and I'm really thankful for that for that idea. Um, should we? I was thinking at this point, should we open it up for anyone physically here to ask questions? Yeah, yeah, I don't know. Like, <laughs> we still have a few more messages here. Uh, yeah. Cool. I, 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 I have one. Um, actually, I was thinking more about. The territory where these are located, um, and uh, not really thinking about north and south, but uh, because you also talked, and I was also thinking about this. Uh, what are the implications about um, about having such a strong brain, almost like a corporation, um, as it's are, and what are and what are the variations between um, between between the different. The different XRs in the different areas or the different mm -hmm. areas or how they operate. And I was also thinking um, because I mentioned that many of the um, uh, XR cells or XR groups uh, they just dismantle themselves. And yep. if, if that has not only to do about the people because they get to have time because they have personal problems that we need to solve. Yeah. Um, but if, if the challenge of challenges of specific territories also influence uh, how they operate because I yeah. guess that there are territories or small um, uh, ge geographies that do not have as many uh, climate impacts as uh, on their yeah. the daily lives uh, as others that I could that could also be interesting to, to, um, to look at it. Uh, yeah. 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 Um, I think I think this this question it goes a little bit. I think the dismantle over time it go. Uh, uh, I, I, was, I was just talking because that question kind of complements what Bernard. Bernard, like, yeah. And also one of my observations we we talked about for uh, being able to get data for the creation of the chapters, but you didn't talk. Anything about the solution of the chapter because I think besides looking at 
how they are created, what is right there for the different continents or regions from the different clusters. It's also important for them to be able to evaluate density when they go away. Yes. Because most of the chapters, um, when I speak from, from my own knowledge and experience on it, they don't remember to uh, deactivate the Facebook or Instagram yeah. accounts after yeah. they, they go to sleep. You saw the one of the yeah. users talk slightly about the thing that you see that went to sleep. But sometimes they go back up and then they go, they go back to sleep. So um, yeah. Um, yeah. I think it would be a challenge yeah. to know how to um, interpret that part of the data regarding the density and the, the actual uh, rate of creation and persistence of the chapter. Yeah. So that you can also compare the, the Western world to any other region where you have national yeah. chapters instead of regional chapters. The fact that he is not uh, active in this moment it doesn't mean that uh, maybe the group is just missing some time. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Particularly in such a country. Yes. Yeah. So, well, it's difficult to trace, but there is a. I had a The other thing, the other aspect of this, which is which is hard to, um, which which we all also aware is missing, is the reactivation of chapters. Chapters that basically die for a year, um, and then people suddenly, oh yeah, we have to get back to that. And, and we heard something from that from like New Zealand as yeah. well. You know, so people say that like. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, true. We we thought about getting data on the last post. You know the date of the last post they would have on Facebook, but that we that data that we collected was not very reliable, and at the same time it can give us, you know, as you were saying, it's it you know it can be just one person that is still operating the Facebook page and like putting um, and doing posts there, not telling us a lot really if that group is still active or not. I mean, the dissolution of the chapters, you know, we can, with this data, we are able to measure the creation of chapters, or at least that someone, at least one person might have said, like, I'm going to create a chapter and see if, like, we can create roots, you know? Um, it's but it's it it something, but doesn't tell, it, it it doesn't tell us enough. Like, but yeah. we couldn't really think of other ways of doing this as well. So we know the data has limitations and we're not arguing that. Uh, but you know, at least there was around the eventful process, there was some enthusiasm about creating um, new chapters and trying to create roots in some in some groups. But we surely the interviews at least have been quite interesting to answer the Bernardo's question that I think what we're going to see, and actually when we start consulting documents and so on, is like the regional variations of of XR. With this data, we cannot say much about that as well. Um, yeah, I don't know. No, yeah, exactly. That, that one, of the, one of the issues, I guess, with, um, you know, often the case, obviously, with quantitative data is that it's, it's relatively flat um, in, in those regards. And um, your question about the brand is, is, really, is, really, is really good because um, they have created this really strong brand um, and aspects of it are really strong and aspects of it are kind of loose and open to shift and in interpretation. And we do see that kind of again really at early stages when it comes to the, the, the quality of data collection, but we've really seen that in terms of like realizations that the the cultural assumptions built into the brand are not going to work. Um, actually, one of one of the aspects of um, you know we looked at protest um, events 
data, but actually our, our um, we had our first interview, actually the, the, uh, on Monday of this week, we had the first interview um, in, in the Gambia. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and that individual was telling us that like, basically because of a variety of cultural and political and economic um, features of the Gambia, um, uh, uh, strikes work better in terms of getting people on, on board in terms of trying to reach um, the public positively. Um, and they're also very aware that, uh, say, the Gambia, it, one meter rise of the sea level um, would uh, deluge 8% of the country's land mass, um, which would massively affect agriculture. The country would heavily depend on agriculture. At the same time, uh, the country emits very, very little CO2 um, and doesn't have a huge amount of financial capacity to do anything other uh, you know, about, about the nature of the situation. It's a very, very different scenario to, um, say, protests in, in Canada or, or um, um, US, uh, Australia. Um, so it's you know, very, very different, very different scenarios. So it has, it's had to adjust. Um, uh, the, aesthetic, the aesthetic of XR is kind of barely consistent. Um, but uh, we do see even if this is this is something for another another project. But we do see kind of um, attempts to vary, it, especially linguistically, um, uh, you know, putting it trans translating things into other languages. Um, but often with uh, some of the core aesthetic um, qualities maintained. Um, and yeah. then and then sometimes my impression is that they might become other movements. They might create spin-offs out of XR because they start the activity and that's something that we might want to explore. Um, I mean, in Portugal there's like XR and then there's Climatia. I don't know what exactly the relation between them is. My impression is that they appear more or less at the same time. So there's, there might be a connection between the two of them. Uh, and certainly the interview from Gambia was also telling something similar, right? So there's XR, but there's also spin-offs that meanwhile emerge to confront particular problems they have in each region, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, even, even uh, and that does seem to be a feature there as well, even with seeing like... Um, it seems all, I think science is so strong as a friend. They can take cells and the <laughs> yeah, we have Alejandro um, Siordia. What actually is asking, I don't know if Alejandro is around still, but he's kind of asking the question along the same, uh, you know, like that probably, I think that many observations of your data set might be attempts. And Alejandro is actually, we talked about it, I talked with him previously. And he's actually doing research on XR in Spain. So he actually is someone on the ground that knows uh, what's happening. Um, your data set might be attempts at creating chapters that failed soon afterwards and died soon. And we have a plane um, died soon after its creation without having organized much collective action. That at least my impression within, within XR Spain, which coincides with the New Zealand experience you talked about. So I was wondering where whether you think it would be feasible to supplement your data with information on chapters, mortality consolidation, at least for some countries, which would be very useful to explore, to explore as well the impact of abeyance. Yeah, I mean, that's what we talked about. And I think we need to think of measures actually, if we want to see the rate of survival in a way to what happened with XR. And Tom is asking, I don't know if Tom is still around, if he wants to come. The number of small chapters in A and Z. I mean, it's a towards consultation and centralization of the Hi, Tom. Hi. Yeah, I'm still here. I'm actually on leave, so you can't actually see me. Um, yeah, I was just, I remember having a chat with Pete, um, and Pete mentioned XRYE. <laughs> I think I laughed out loud. Um, 
because it is a it's a very small former gold mining town. And from what we talked about, Pete, how there was a, a couple of people that you said were quite influential, mm -hmm. and in the quote they talked about what was happening in uh, Dunedin, Invercargill, mm -hmm. Wellington. So they clearly had a an idea of what was happening around the country. So that question of if these um, defunct chapters almost serve as a kind of advertising. So there's a, a group, or there was a group in Waihe, but it tends to be, it may evolve, so it tends to be people at the top, people that have the experience are able to draw on those connections in other places. And I just kind of throwing that out there as I was mulling it over. Yeah, mm. that's, a, that's a really good point. Um, yeah. and I think that might, we might be able to measure that or see some of that trend with the interviews, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Um, it seems, at least from, from the data we have already, um, that, uh, uh, that a lot of these, a, a lot of uh, the, the, the kind of death of chapters came with very inexperienced but excited um, uh, younger people want, who wanted to get involved in the in activism actually was kind of very it was the it was the chapters that were established and maintained by kind of older activists who had been in the game yeah. for a long time who were able to um, put in place the organizational requirements you need um, to, to do this kind of thing that's an important point um, yeah. uh, it, it's quite a funny moment in in our interview where um, where our interviewee said a lot of these guys you know joined because they thought the revolution was coming you know <laughs> the revolution is going to come tomorrow and so they they created a, a chapter to become part of that you know um and then when the revolution didn't come um, the next day um they were kind of disappointed and disbanded um so there does seem to be um you know that dimension of kind of experience um, yeah you know. which is not i mean thinking about it other movements that i've studied is not only a a, a feature of movements of this particular movement is something that happens with the, and, and normally movements that tend to persist it's when they have very experienced people uh, working on on that um so yeah uh, and this is a good i mean again this is like uh, the question that tom is asking about tendency to consolidation to centralization over time it's to be really interesting to measure that if we have the dissolution kind of measures, you know, and to see the rate of activities in Facebook and so on. But still, we need to probably think about that again. Yeah. <laughs> and like how, because if you think of like indicators that we can collect online as well for this amount of chapters to see if, um, because I think that could be something that we could measure as well with the number, I don't know, maybe the number of people that joined the group on Facebook and so on and so forth. I know, could be, um, could be uh, interesting as well. Yeah. We're kind of aware that, that this is why we put in place, we did this and then we went on to qualitative. Um, we're kind of aware that to do this, to do this fully, we'd have to sort of talk to every chapter is willing to talk to us in the world. Um, and that's not necessarily an achievable aim, but at least we're we into Oh, we can have 50 years. Uh, well, I suppose. I suppose. Um, well, at least we, we aim to uh, aim to try and get as much of that from qualitative yeah. data as possible because because um, there just are, are a lot of limitations in the quantitative. But um, from, what, from what we think, we, from what we covered today anyway, it's, it's up to the limit of what we, we felt we could achieve with, with this data. Um, but yeah, if there's any other questions or comments on it, I appreciate it. Uh, yeah. Bye. Ah. I think that she was just telling. Ah, okay. <laughs> oh, right. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
you see that the, the, there are some um, theoretical points emerged here. The fact that the, the mesh reflects some of the two uh, abelian structure and that the visibility and lattice here is very, very attractive from the theoretical point of view. Uh, it could be, I don't know, maybe you could do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'll show you this here. <laughs> <laughs> So your your main question and the uh, um, say uh, analytical uh, proposal is to understand which is the relation with the event and the and the and the, and the situation. No? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is I think. That, but you have much more things than me. Right? Yeah. So. Uh, I think I think that I mean those are all you know we even to this morning when we were looking again to the presentation and finishing we we're like discussing well you know I think the points that we're going to be done are this and and there's a lot of questions that we say that that doesn't answer um, but I think you're right about the variance and latency and also the question that you that that Donatella and Sydney put forward right. But this data, again, doesn't really tell us, and I think that's something for us to think in the future as well. Although, uh, and you were saying there's a lot of data, a lot of in this data that we can use to like make further points. And I think one of the things that we were discussing this morning is like, actually we don't have um, an argument for the geographical data. We just have an argument for, for the, 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 temp, the temporal dynamics, right? And-, and Yeah, the data don't fit really with the, yeah, the geographical why these places don't uh, say anything about the question. Yeah, um, but I'm, I'm just thinking that the, the data that Maria helped us to collect, and I actually discussed that with her at the time, the way that X star, and that's something that maybe we can include later on in the paper and some other paper, um, what it Shown is that XR in different countries would involve itself in protests differently. So in some of the countries, it would take the lead, but in some of the countries, actually, it would integrate wider movements um, 
Um, so, you know, there are different forms of integration and adaptation of XR. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so we, that's something we need actually to look to, to, to the how question as well, right? Of how do they integrate or how do they spread and diffuse? Um, I think the interview from, from Gambia actually told us something about the one of the why's, um, one of the reasons or the causes why it doesn't spread so much into southern south the global south if you want uh, the lack of access to technology and and the internet. But this is just me thinking aloud, so maybe <laughs> you better go forward now. <laughs> uh, no, I think I think actually that's very very clearly yeah, we're kind of. We're aware with the descriptive description of the, the, the geographical spread. We are just describing it, but our conclusion from that is basically that it's um, in terms of density, it was it was just um, Anglosphere and, and Western Europe where that where that occurred. And so our 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 kind of our description is what we're aiming for there. But I, I think you're right. It's just like there is certainly a need to account for that. Yeah, but it's not masturbation. It's the is there a really That's something like we always, that's, you know, as I say, it's a hobby because we have so many other things to do that we try to like go in like, you know, so what's the next step, right? And like sometimes it's also like, okay, the interview will do, but like we could be doing so much more, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, do we have any, do you want to? Oh, she did that it's a, it's, it is a, it's a really important point that like we can overestimate. You can conclude from this data that therefore there are no chapters elsewhere, but they certainly could be um, occurring entirely offline and they could even be um, taking place without being fishy registered, going mm -hmm. down the route of fishy registering um, online through the XR website. And I think that's a really, a really important point. One, one thing we do raise actually. Um, in the methodological section is um, the fact that in terms of uh, chapters missing, um, so of the of the um, 888 chapters in Europe, 10% um, or 10.5% are missing, um, have no have no Facebook page, um, whereas that figure is um, it's 19 of the 158 in North America, it's eight of the 42 in Asia, it's 21 of the 107 in Oceania. Um, and it's uh, uh, for in, in Africa, it's 15 of the 39. Um, in South America, it's 18 of the 31. So we see much higher percentages there, as 38 percent and 58 percent. Um, so obviously, there's there's data missing there in terms of the temporal data. Um, in terms of the spatial data, we we have that there. But um, but you're right. Even in terms of the spatial data, it's quite possible that, that there's no online. Are they already finished? Uh, no. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, oh, the dates are the dates are like uh, available, but like the Facebook pages are are 
it, it differs, right? So like XR Japan is almost entirely in English. Um, and uh, where, whereas like uh, XR in um, Germany is entirely in Japan. Yeah, it's kind of, kind of different. <laughs> Um, uh, there are any other questions here? Do, do we have any other questions from the people at home? Well, yes. Doesn't look like it. Uh, well, um, if not, maybe I can. Ah, uh, yeah, sure. Uh, just to can you well see my website? <laughs> can you? Yeah, for those at home, uh, let me just show you the page. Uh, um, this one, yeah. and maybe in English, no? Uh, yeah, and you can find all the, you know, the past activities since 2014 when Guya and Brita Maumgarten started um started uh, this seminar that's been ongoing it's been very important for the social movement scholars here in portugal uh, i think it's the first time that i present actually i think i presented a couple of times already <laughs> and i also i'm joined the coordination team and so this this last year we've been we've done a lot of online events which are available if you go to like to the page you can see the youtube videos but also we've been trying to do the effort now that we can meet and uh, there's no lockdowns uh, despite the, some of the restrictions we also been trying to record the sessions because you know there are actually uh it's actually interesting to keep them to remember them for us it's going to be amazing because we can go back to the many of the comments that we had but also, um, you know, to study in, in classes and in lectures and so on, and to keep a register. So we've been trying to keep this a hybrid, also to reach out to other uh, people that are not in Lisbon. Uh, and so we can connect with those people as well. So, yeah, uh, and so we can, you can find all the information. Ah, uh, yeah, I'll share. Well, I'll stop the share. Probably it's easier. And there you go. The link for our page. And thank you, everyone, for coming. Really glad. I mean, like, I think we, we, we're going to take a, a lot. Uh, back and we have a lot to think and how to the next steps and what we uh doing afterwards as well so yeah thanks thanks a lot for the opportunity and thanks a lot for all the comments and suggestions yeah. thank you thank you <laughs> okay i'll stop it now Can I stop? See, bye.